By 1792, you have two distinct political parties. You have Hamilton's Federalist Party, which roughly follows Hamilton's ideas about government and the future of the United States. Again, Hamilton thinks people are generally the mob. You have a handful of elite. But with most people the mob, you need a strong centralized authority with a large national army to keep the mob in check. You need to create closer ties to the elite uh, in order for them to support the national government. Hamilton would love to see the United States full of factories uh, and with closer commercial ties to Britain. And again, part of this is because Hamilton favors Britain, uh, just likes the way the British set up their system, and he likes the fact that the United States has done business with Britain for a very long time. Well, by 1792, this second party has emerged, this Republican Party. The part of it is just anti-Hamilton. You have a lot of people that just see what Hamilton is doing with the government, think it's leading too much in the direction of a monarchy. They don't like it for those reasons. And you have other people that join this Republican Party because they fall in line with Jefferson's line of thinking that people are in general good, democracy is better, uh, a more localized government in the form of state governments, having more power, that's the way you should go with the government. Uh, and you should have more people, agricultural, owning their own land, and the United States should form closer ties to France. As we talked about, this Republican Party had formed enough opposition to prevent uh, Hamilton's report on manufacturers from getting past the 1792, and there's starting to be open arguments in Congress between the political parties. The thing is, though, in 1792, while you start having political disagreements, things aren't going to get personal just yet, and you're not going to see them get personal for a couple of years, and I'm going to give an example of this. So in 1791, Hamilton is going to be working probably 1791 he might be finishing up his last touches on you know his national bank reform uh, maybe finishing up the last touches on whiskey tax he could be writing the early stages of the report on manufacturers he's sitting in at this point in Philadelphia serving as secretary of the treasury when out of nowhere he's gonna get a knock on his door knock 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 well, back in those days, if you wanted to speak to somebody in government, it's a lot easier to do than it is today. Today, you'd probably have to know somebody. You'd probably have to make an appointment two years in advance. And, you know, even then, very good luck speaking to the Secretary of the Treasury. Well, things are different back then. So, Hamilton's going to get a knock on this door. And in through the door is going to walk in this beautiful 23-year-old woman named Maria Reynolds. Now, there's no portraits of Maria Reynolds surviving um, so we don't know exactly what she looks like but from all accounts she's incredibly beautiful well Maria Reynolds is going to have a sob story for Alexander Hamilton according to Maria Reynolds she has been being abused by her new husband so Maria Reynolds had recently uh, gotten married and she's been living in Philadelphia with her husband but her husband had been abusive towards her. Her husband had recently gone out of town, and while she, her husband's out of town, she's decided that she wants to petition the state of Pennsylvania for a divorce. Back then, you could get divorced. They were more rare than they are today, but they happened. But in order to get a divorce, you had to petition the state legislature for a divorce, and the state legislature would grant these in cases of abuse uh, and a couple other incidents. But the problem is it's going to take time. So Maria Reynolds is worried that by the time her husband gets back in town, um, the process of divorce won't have been finished. So she wants to get back home to her family in New York. So she's from New York where Hamilton's from. And so she believes as a fellow New Yorker, he can help her by providing her with a little bit of cash to get to New York. Well, she talks to Hamilton. Is there any way you could help me um, uh, help me out here, Secretary of the Treasury, fellow New Yorker? Can you give me some money to get to my family? Well, Hamilton will tell Maria Reynolds that he's busy. He can't do anything for her right now, but he'd like to talk with her more about it this evening. So basically, Hamilton is going to give Maria Reynolds a little bit of money and tell her to go get a, a room in a boarding house nearby and after Alexander Hamilton gets off he's going to meet Maria Reynolds at the boarding house and 
<sighs> there's going to be he's going to give her more than money. Let me just put it that way. There's no no soft way to put it. They're going to start an affair. And I say affair because not only is Maria Reynolds married, but Alexander Hamilton's married. Uh, his wife is actually currently pregnant with, I don't know, fourth, fifth, sixth kid, something like that. So they're both married. But, again, Maria Reynolds' husband's out of town. So they have this affair, and the affair is going to continue for the coming weeks and months. Uh, so Alexander Hamilton keeps meeting Maria Reynolds. Eventually, actually, his wife is going to go out of town. Uh, it's New York during the summer, 1791. There's a uh, malaria outbreak, and so everybody gets out of town. They they basically quarantine unless you've got business to do. And uh, Alexander Hamilton's wife's pregnant. You don't want to get malaria when you're pregnant, so she goes and moves north for the summer. When this happens, Alexander Hamilton moves Maria Reynolds into his house, and they have this affair over the course of the summer. As a matter of fact, in the middle of the summer, uh, Alexander Hamilton's wife's going to write and say, yeah, you know, I've heard that malaria is not that bad this year. I was thinking about coming back to New York with the kids and, and seeing you. Hamilton's like, no, 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 stay away, stay away. Everything, malaria is everywhere here, stay away. So he tells his wife to stay away. They continue this affair. Eventually his wife comes back, but he and Maria Reynolds continue their affair in, in other locations. Well, coming towards the end of 1791, Maria Reynolds is going to enter Alexander Hamilton's office and she's going to have some bad news for him. She's going to tell him, my husband has returned to town and he's learned about our affair and he says that he is going to reveal this to the press unless you pay him a thousand dollars well back then that's a lot of money I mean that's a lot of money today uh, back in 1791 that is a lot a lot of money but Alexander Hamilton he made some money as a private lawyer he's gonna take some of this money pay off Maria Reynolds husband and Basically, he's going to say, you know, um, uh, I've got to end this thing anyway, so this will bring this thing to a close. So he pays Maria Reynolds' husband. The affair seems to be over, and he's upset by it, but, you know, uh, at least he's not going to get out to the press. Well, not too long after, he's going to get a knock on his door, and Maria Reynolds' husband is going to come through it. Well, her husband's going to say, I appreciate that $1,000. I'm not going to tell anybody. Um, but, you know, you've been having this affair uh, with my wife. It can continue if you keep this money coming in. So Maria Reynolds' husband will basically start prostituting his wife to Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton will can start paying the husband to have this relationship with uh, Maria Reynolds. This continues on into 1792. Alexander Hamilton at this point he starts to realize how messed up this is. You know, not only am I ha uh, sleeping around with my wife, but, um, you know, th this money exchange thing is, is kind of getting crazy. So he's going to, on a number of occasions, try to break it off with Maria Reynolds. But every time he does, uh, Maria Reynolds will say she can't live without him and threaten to commit suicide. So Hamilton is going to continue the affair, continue the affair. Until finally, around the middle of 1792, he's going to say, I, I can't do this any longer. I've got to cut this off. And he breaks it off. Well, things might have ended there, except Maria Reynolds' husband shortly thereafter will be arrested for counterfeiting. So what he's doing is he's taking, he's counterfeiting bank notes from this new national bank. So whenever you invest money in the new national bank, again, Hamilton had pushed for Whenever you put money in there, government puts money in there. You can also get these private investors to put money in the National Bank. It's a confusing thing, but uh, you put money in there, then it gets loaned out. You get your money back with interest later. But basically, if you store gold or silver in there, you get a, a note saying, this, this is worth five pieces of silver, or whatever, something like that. So Maria Reynolds' husband figured, if I print this, these things out, bring it to the National Bank, I'll just withdraw the silver that's not mine, gold that's not mine. And he started printing these counterfeit notes. He's eventually caught for counterfeiting, and he's going to be thrown in jail. Well, he gets thrown in jail, and he's going to decide, doesn't want to be in jail, so he's got an idea. I hear that Hamilton now is starting to face this Republican Party. He's got a lot of political enemies. So I'm going to try to leverage my information uh, I have on Hamilton to get myself free. 
So he's essentially going to call up James Madison, uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, and James Madison's going to show up to confer with uh, Maria Reynolds' husband. And basically Madison will say, uh, you know, what do you got for me? Well, Maria Reynolds' husband will lay out the whole story of the affair, and Madison, after hearing it, is going to be, so he's having this affair with your wife. Did he have anything to do with the bank notes? Did he use his position as Secretary of the Treasury to pay off, pay you off? Did that money come from the United States government? Marie Reynolds' husband is going to say, no, he used it, his own private funds, and he didn't have anything to do with the bank notes. That was on me. But you heard the stuff about him sleeping with my wife, right? Well, Madison, even though he opposes Hamilton, again, he's from the opposition party, is going to say, doesn't matter. I do don't care about that stuff. That is private. He didn't use his position in the United States government for anything wrong. So I don't like Hamilton. I don't like what he's doing. My fellow Republicans don't like what he's doing. But he's not doing anything wrong with his position. This is a private matter. And Madison is going to sit on the information. Now, I'm sure he went back to Jefferson. Jefferson, you won't believe what, the, what I just heard. Hamilton is up to this stuff. And I'm sure they knew in private circles. But in public, Madison doesn't reveal this information. That's 1792 when this happens. By the end of what we're about to talk about, 1796, 1797, not only is Madison going to reveal this information, but we're going to see that Party politics have gotten personal to the point where it's okay to uh, release this type of information about your political opponent. So Republicans and Federalists are going to go from the point in 1792 of being disagreeing with one another politically to just four years later disagreeing not only politically but also personally and wanting to attack their enemy. So what we're going to talk about is how and why this is going to happen. Why does party politics turn so uh, uh, turn so vindictive and get so personal? Well, a lot of this is going to be because of what happens internationally, not within the United States, but things that are going to happen in Europe that are going to draw the U.S. in. So during Washington's first administration, Jefferson and Hamilton had their own ideas about England and France. Jefferson is Secretary of State. He favors France. Hamilton, Secretary of Treasury. He favors Britain. They both like who they like. But both of these guys, up to uh, during Washington's first administration, think the United States should remain neutral, should be focused on its own affairs. Again, the U.S. already went through one failed government with the Arctic Confederation. They're on their second one. The uh, U.S. is in debt. Hamilton's starting to pay this off, but it's got its own problems. We're worried about sticking together. We don't want to worry about what's going on in Europe. So even though these guys favor who they, uh, the countries they favor, they they believe that the U.S. should handle its own business before anything else. So that's going to be the way things are prior to 1792. Okay, so 1789 to 1792. Uh, these guys are calling for neutrality. Well, something's going to happen in 1792, 1793 that is going to force the United States or push the United States into siding with either Britain or France, or it's going to make the United States uh, uh, get involved in international politics. So what's going to happen is something that began in 1789. So in 1789, you're going to see the people of France, all the way over in Europe, France, who had helped the United States in the American Revolution, the French go through what's called the French Revolution. Now, there are a lot of things to blame for this French Revolution. Yeah, a lot of people just say it's the same things that led to the American Revolution. Basically, you had these Enlightenment ideals all around. And then you add to the fact that France had helped the United States in the American Revolution. They win a ton of debt. And the French monarchy, the king and queen, are going to look to the poor French people to pay a lot of uh, this debt. The French people questioning monarchy already because they're hopped up on this Enlightenment literature, now having to pay these taxes, are going to rise up and start fighting off the monarchy. 
So some people say that. Other people say it's just food shortages lead to it. Other people, you know, you'll hear that uh, you can tell revolutions coming uh, based on the amount of rat poop in the flour. Whatever the reason, the French are going to rise up in 1789. And from the beginning, or at least at the beginning, we're going to see that this French Revolution is going to closely rep, uh, resemble the American Revolution. What's going to happen is there's going to be an overthrow of the monarchy and there's going to be an installation of a Republican government in France. So French people rise up, monarchy gets overthrown, and a Republican government gets installed in France. So right at that point, similar to the American Revolution. But after this, we're going to see the French Revolution is going to turn in ways that into something very different than the American Revolution. So whereas the American Revolution had uh, had uh, resulted in this uh, war against uh, uh, Britain and then installation of the Republican government, and then it sort of stopped there, French Revolution's not going to stop. What you're going to have is a lot of bloodshed. American Revolution didn't have a lot of bloodshed. It was, and when it did, it was generally soldiers versus soldiers, or at least militia versus soldiers. It was British versus colonists. That's not going to be the case here in France. This is going to turn a lot of ways into a class warfare. A lot of people say the American Revolution aren't, isn't a true revolution because you don't have bloodshed and you don't have uh, class change. You only really have um, a change in government. Well, the French Revolution is going to have all three. Basically, there's going to be a lot of bloodshed. Again, maybe 8,000 battlefield deaths in the American Revolution. French Revolution from 1789 to about 1799, 1800 is going to have something like 40,000 deaths a year in France. So, very bloody. As a matter of fact, what will happen during this is you're going to see not just you know monarchists attacking republicanists but you'll see the poor attacking the wealthy as a matter of fact you know the aristocrats the poor will go in their house rip them out of there destroy their private property start chopping their heads off king and queen eventually are going to get their heads chopped off and this is going to be a lot of bloodshed a ton of property destruction so it's different in that regard it's a class struggle mixed in with uh, this uh, government struggle and I say government struggle because that's another place the American Revolution is going to differ, differ from the French Revolution whereas the American Revolution went from a monarchy under Britain to a Republican government we're going to see during this French Revolution it's going to be chaos basically you're going to have the different points something like 10 very different styles of government in France. So you start out with a monarchy and you're going to have people in France continue to push through a monarchy throughout the whole revolution. You're going to have some people calling for what you would call a constitutional monarchy where you still have a king but they're limited in power by a constitution. You'll have some people calling for a republican government like the United States has where you have representatives. You'll have other people pushing for democracy where basically just about everybody can vote and the people are involved a lot more in the political process and you'll have other people pushing for essentially anarchy and what's going to happen with the French Revolution is when one group gets power the other groups are going to look around nope that's not what I want and they're going to overthrow that government well this government's going to be in power for a little bit they're going to be overthrowing uh, that next government and you're going to see one government fall another government and it's going to be chaos so you're going to have people chopping each other's heads out on the street and then you're going to have constant government turnover uh, as one group gets in power and the other groups basically say I don't like the way things are and you're going to have them then overthrow this government so that's in a way that this is going to be different another way that this French Revolution will be different than the American Revolution is that the second that the United States uh, got its independence 1783 it really does say we're staying out of international affairs we don't want to deal with any other country we need to get our stuff together that doesn't happen here in France. In 1792, you get a semi-stable government in France, and the second this happens, this French revolutionary government is going to say, "We're going to spread this revolution to all of Europe." Not only do we not, or do we believe in our form of government and the fact that we believe that monarchies are wrong, we want to spread this belief throughout the uh, throughout Europe. So basically, United States. End of uh, stable government, leave us alone. France, second get stable government. We're going to declare war on all monarchies in Europe. And basically, they're going to be institute this. We're just going to kill every effing king there is in Europe. So beginning 1792, uh, we'll see France go to war 
essentially with the entirety of Europe. Uh, so all these different kings, they don't want to get their head chopped off like the king of France got his head chopped off. So all these different countries will start fighting the French. Even the Spanish uh, will fight the French for a time, and they're usually best buddies. But not none of these matter as much as Britain fighting France. So once again, beginning 1792, we're going to have the British and the French go to war. So we've had this constantly throughout the 1700s. War of Spanish succession, Austrian succession, uh, Seven Years War, American Revolution, and we're just getting out of this American Revolution. Less than 10 years later, we got the British and French at it yet again. So France declares war on all kings, 1792-1793, and once again the British and French are at war. So all this chaos is happening over in Europe. Well, here in the United States, you're going to have very different opinions on the French Revolution. Jefferson, he loves France. He loves liberty. He loves the idea of Republican government. He hears what happens in, is happening in France. He's going to give it a thumbs up. He's like, yeah, I, I, like, I don't like monarchs. I like the people taking power, like seizing power. Now, this chopping the head off the wealthy, I, I don't like anything like that. I, don't, I think we're going a little too far in the violence, bloodshed section. But I like the idea of revolution in general. Thumbs up France. So Republicans in general are going to be favoring France, and uh, they're hoping that this Republican government works out. To Hamilton and the Federalist, this is chaos. This is everything that they fear. Basically, they look at the French Revolution as the mob getting control. This is what happens if you let the mob have their way. They're going to start chopping the head off the wealthy, and it's just going to be bloodshed, chaos. This is what happens if you don't keep the mob in check. So uh, in when France goes to war with Britain, the Federalists will basically hope the British win that war. So you're going to have very different opinions, and you're going to have all these different ideas being thrown at George Washington. Well, Washington, when uh, this war breaks out, is basically going to say, we're going to have neutrality. And he actually does this based off the recommendations of these two guys. So Jefferson, even though he favors France, he realizes we've got our own stuff to take care of we're not in a position to help the French out so we should declare neutrality same thing Hamilton even though he would prefer the British to win even though he thinks the uh, French Revolution is chaotic he understands the US isn't in a position to do anything about it so he's going to encourage Washington to be neutral and so in 1792 1793 Washington's gonna start this impartial stance he basically is not officially neutrality he says we're gonna be impartial observers of what's going on which is technically neutrality so what does it mean to be neutral when Washington says that what does it mean to be neutral well the thing is there's no international constitution there's no international rules of neutrality so the US the various states that now make it the US they've agreed to follow the rules of this constitution but there's no UN at this time there's no international body to make sure that foreign nations follow a set of rules there's not even any Geneva conventions that people have agreed upon so when you're declaring neutrality or impartiality you're declaring certain things and you're expecting the other side to follow the same rules but they've never agreed to follow the same rules so when the US declares neutrality what they're under the assumption is that this neutrality means US isn't obviously isn't going to punch one side or another. If you go into a bathroom, you got Bill and Tom punching each other, you can't say, you know, I'm neutral and then just punch Tom. You're obviously not neutral. So the U.S. understands that by declaring neutrality, I'm not going to be helping either side. So that's uh, one thing that they understand with neutrality. Uh, also neutrality, you don't let enemy ships use your ports. I mean, that's kind of a simple one. You don't uh, have let your private citizens, if they're citizens of the United States, they can't join in the fighting uh, for one side or another. Your ships, your merchant ships can't join in the fighting for one side or another. So no fighting. That part's not that hard to, uh, that, that part's not that confusing. The confusing part, however, is going to be commerce. If you are a neutral nation, can you allow your citizens to trade with either nation? So Bill Bilson doesn't work for the United States government. He just ships tobacco. Let's say tobacco. Sometimes he ships to Britain. Sometimes he ships it to France. 
can he continue to ship it to France and the U.S. government still be neutral? Can U.S. private citizens still ship stuff to France? Well, the way, the way the U.S. understands neutrality is that their citizens should be able to ship to either side, and no, neither side can do anything as long as the goods are a non-war material. So something like tobacco, wool, um, leather, that kind of stuff, uh, they can ship it to France, Britain, and they're supposed to go unimpeded. So uh, you go on, you're heading to France, even if a British ship happens to pull you over and says, where are you going? I'm going to France. Well, what do you got in there? I've got a, a wool. Well, that British commander may be you know, because these British ships, the best navy in the world, when their naval ships pulls you over, he can go and search it, but the second he sees that it's tobacco and, or leather or whatever, he's supposed to let you go straight on to France, not stop you. That's the way the U.S. understands the rules of war, that neither side can stop our sh uh, merchant shipping non-war materials. Now, the way the U.S. understands this is that its private citizens can also ship war materials to either side. So, if a U.S. merchant is carrying guns and it's heading to France, it can head there. And U.S. is going to remain neutral. It doesn't mean they're favoring France if a U.S. private citizen ships to France. And if he gets to France, it's going to make a heavy profit because during times of war, neutral nations make a ton of money. So he's going to make a ton of money. But U.S. understands that if that citizen is then stopped by the British, so let's say a British ship sees this about to pull up into a French port, the British ship says, what do you got on board? Uh, yeah, you know, I got leather. And then the British officer goes and inspects and finds guns. The U.S. understands the British can then seize those guns, seize the ships. Now they're supposed to release the sailors, uh, you know, drop them off at the nearest port or whatever, but they can officially seize that stuff. And when that captain then comes back to, to Washington and says, they seized my stuff, Washington is going to have to say, yeah, I understand, buddy, but that's the rules of war. That's the game you're playing. We're not going to complain about it because the rules are you can seize the weapons of a neutral, or you can seize ship of neutral uh, nation if they're shipping arms to one side or another. So let me just be make this clear. This isn't the U.S. government shipping things to either side. It's just private citizens, and the U.S. thinks it can ship to either side, but it understands that if one side or the other seizes war materials, it's not going to complain. All right. Now, if British or French start sh seizing ships that are carrying food or medicine or something, now the U.S. might start getting involved, might start talking about taking one side or another. But as long as they just ship seize war materials, uh, then we're not going to complain. Okay. So basically, they think we can trade under these rules. Well, as you're going to see, both France and Britain are going to look at this U.S. De de declaration of impartiality and this U.S. you know, wanting to follow the neutral rules, and almost immediately both sides are going to start breaking the rules of neutrality, at least the rules of neutrality as the U.S. understands them. So we'll see this first from France. So what the French are going to do, and this happens in 1793, is they're going to send a guy over to serve as ambassador to the United States, a guy named Edmund Genet, and Edmund Genet is going to violate U.S. neutral rights in a couple different ways, right? So, 1793, France has a semi-stable government. It's at war with all these nations of Europe, and this government sends over Edmund Genet. So, what ambassadors basically do is they go to the nation's capital. I mean, it's still the same way today. You live in the diplomat's residence, and then whenever you've got issues between your country and the country you're staying in, the ambassador serves as a liaison. You know, today, same issue, same deal. You know, U.S. has ambassadors in Chile and Peru, things like that. If issues come up, the ambassador sort, sort of serves as a liaison. So, Genet is going to be the French liaison to uh, the U.S. government. So, as a liaison, he's supposed to head to Philadelphia, where the U.S. capital is. So, 1793, uh, Janae's going to head over, and he should have headed right in here, gone to Philadelphia. Instead, though, Janae is going to head and land in Charleston, South Carolina. And what he's going to do is slowly make his way up to Philadelphia. And what he's going to do is he's going to stop basically at every major city all the way from Charleston to Philadelphia. And what he does in each of these cities is he's going to start petitioning American citizens to 
join the war against Britain. He's going to say, I wish I could do a French accent. I can't. American. No, that's, that's a horrible one. But join, uh, join uh, the French. We are fellow Republicans. We are uh, like you in a world filled with monarchies. Um, we're fighting against all the monarchs of the world. We want to export our revolution. Please support us. And tell your politicians to support us. So basically he wants the American people to get their politicians to join the French. Not only that, but Janae will start enlisting loans from American citizens. So we'll stop in one city. Hey, we could use our support to buy guns to fight the British. Let me borrow some money. Not only that, but he starts stopping by uh, these port cities along the way. And he starts actually using some of this money to hire American merchant ships. So guys that just use it for fishing or trading. And uh, what he's going to do is say, hey guys, slap a cannon on your boat, fly the French flag, and then start attacking the British. So he's actively encouraging the Americans to join in the fight against the British, and he's even hiring Americans to fight the British, pushing the U.S. into war. Well, as he's making his way up, word is going to arrive in Philadelphia what Janae's doing. And you're going to get Washington getting upset about this. You even get Thomas Jefferson. Again, the way Jefferson's thinking is, I want the French to win this war, but I don't want the U.S. to get involved. This guy's sort of pushing us to get involved. And so Jefferson's going to start getting upset with Janae as well. And as soon as Janae arrives in Philadelphia, Washington and Jefferson are going to pull him aside and Washington's be like, you can't do this, Janae. You know, uh, you're causing us a lot of problems. Jefferson's like, dude, you gotta knock this stuff off. I pro France. I love you guys. I love the revolution that's going on over there. But we do not want to be involved when you're trying to pull us into this war. So they're gonna send Janae out, do your French ambassador stuff, but don't push us to war. Now Janae is gonna leave, and and you know maybe things would have gone back to normal. It'd been fine after this, but. Basically, he takes this not the way he should have as, you know, hey, stop dragging us into this war. Instead, he takes this as Washington is jealous. And so he's going to start going around parties in, in Philadelphia, and he's going to start talking smack about Washington. As a matter of fact, he says, old man Washington, uh, yeah, old man Washington is jealous of my success and the enthusiasm with which whole towns flock to my house. So this dude just upset because I'm cool, and he's not. So he's going to start talking about crap about Washington. Well, at this time, even Republicans who don't like that Washington's always siding with Hamilton, they still like Washington, and they're going to uh, pretty much side with Washington, or favor Washington uh, through the rest of his term. They don't like him talking smack about Washington. You don't talk smack about George Washington. So this is pretty much the final straw. Basically what's going to happen is uh, Washington and Jefferson will call up France, okay, not call up, but write France and say, guys, you got to pull this Janae guy back. Send us a new ambassador. I like to imagine it happening this way. Hey, France, this guy is uh, hes causing too much trouble. He's talking smack about GW. Uh, you you got you to gotta send somebody else. And then on the other end of the line, you get this, yes, send him back immediately. Well, oh, crap, that was dark, you know. Uh, you're going to get this uh, uh, response, yes, send him back. You know, what's actually kind of interesting is they are enthusiastic to, to get Janae back because in the time that he's been gone in the United States, the French government got overthrown and a new, uh, a different style of government came, uh, came into power. They want Janae sent back because they want to chop his head off. Basically, they're going to be waiting at the end of the docks with a guillotine. Janae, after talking smack about Washington, has basically got to go back and say, Hey, GW, I know we uh, we had our differences, but I can, I, can I stay here? I don't want to get my head chopped off. Washington will agree to let Janae stay, and uh, I think he ends up being a school teacher or something like that. So uh, anyway, uh, France isn't exactly uh, respecting U.S. neutral rights. But the thing is, they're not respecting U.S. neutral rights, but they're not going to be doing what Britain does. All right, so Britain is going to go even further. So what the British are going to start doing is they're going to start seizing U.S. ships that are trading non-war materials. So the second war starts against France. Britain has a superior navy to the French. So the British, are one of their ways they're going to win this war is they're going to send their naval fleet down here to surround these French islands. So they're a little bit south of what's depicted on this map. But places like Haiti, uh, Barbados, that kind of thing, Martinique, the French have these islands, and they're incredibly profitable. So the British have this idea, 
you know, there's a lot of people on those islands. We might not invade them, be able to invade them right away. But if we surround them, we could starve them out. These islands are filled with uh, a lot of French, a lot of slaves, you know, uh, basically that are fed from France. They're used to grow sugar. Uh, the sugar then goes back to France and it pays for, uh, you know, French soldiers, Navy, that type of thing. But if we starve out these islands, it'll cut off the sugar supply and it'll open them up to invasion by the British. So the British are going to start stationing all of these uh, warships around the French possessions in the Caribbean. All right, so the islands, you know, this starts happening. It looks like the islands are uh, going to get starved out. Well, the U.S. declaring neutrality, you'll start getting a bunch of merchants hearing, hey, if you bring food to these islands or you trade between France and these islands, you're going to make a profit. Basically, the French will say, if you bring food from France to Martinique, we're going to pay you twice what you would normally get for that food. Well, you know, double my profit. American merchants love the sound of that, and they start coming in, and they'll start cruising by the British ships. The British will be saying, you know, you know, uh, trying to stop stuff going in and out, but the Americans will have the American flag. Hey, we're neutral, British buddy, and the British, uh, Americans, they'll have to watch as Americans bring this food into these islands and this non-war material. Well, the British are going to look around, and they're going to say, we're not able to execute our war with what the Americans are doing. So we've got to stop them if we want to actually uh, win this thing. So the British are going to make the decision, uh, 1793, to just start seizing Ameri any American ships that trade with the French. So you might be bringing uh, food in there, non-war material. The British are going to say, nope, we're stopping you, and they'll start seizing these American ships. So the American ships will think they're neutral. The British will start seizing them anyway seizing their goods, taking the ships. As a matter of fact, it's 250 or so uh, American ships from 1793 to 1795 will be seized by these British captains. The British basically tell their captains, any ship you seize, you get to personally profit from it. So that gives them incentives. And then, uh, again, you know, the Americans can't get into these areas if the, the British are blockading it. So now the British are violating neutral rights as the United States understands them. Hey, we're neutral. We're supposed to be trading with whoever you, we want, but you're starting to seize our ships. And you're going to start to see these American merchants complain to Washington, you got to do something about it. The British are not respecting our neutral rights. Well, Washington's worried about this, uh, one of these issues. So the British are straight up just robbing American stuff. All right, well, that's one problem that starts happening in 1793, 1794, 1795. Another thing that's going to start happening is going to involve this Northwest Territory up here. So we've talked about this area before. There have been a handful of Americans that have moved in this region. They'd start to divide up this, this land. But for the most part, this area is unpopulated. They're, they're, Americans hadn't moved in here. And the main people living here are these American Indians, not these densely packed Mississippi culture groups, but these smaller tribes, groups like the Shawnees, Pawnees, Miamis, Ohio's, uh, and these type of groups the, that live in this region, they partially Europeanized, you know, they have uh, been trading with the French before the Seven Years' War for 100 plus years. They traded with the British after this, um, and actually, as we're going to talk about, they've been trading with the British, have been maintaining the forts in this territory. But these, uh, a lot of these Indians had also been pushed west by Americans. So you've got these Indians over here that are already upset with uh, Americans, and they'd been raiding the frontier fairly regularly uh, uh, during the American uh, Articles of Confederation period. Well, the United States, once it came under the Constitution, had tried to actually uh, put together an army to invade the Northwest Territory in this crazy Battle of Wabash in 1791, the Northwest Indians had actually destroyed almost the entirety of the new Constitution uh, Army. I think there was like a 70% uh, death rate in the army killed by these Northwest Indians. So you've got these Indians already powerful in 1791. Um, you know, the U.S. will start rebuilding its army, 1791, 1792. But it's around this time that the Indians are going to start, you know, already they had uh, destroyed the U.S. Army, but they're going to start raiding these frontier settlements with British manufactured weapons, and they're going to start uh, even pushing even further back on the frontier. 
So these Indian group that was already a threat to the Americans become even more of a threat 1791, 1792, 1793. Well, some people suspect that this group is being provided weapons by these British forts in Northwest Territory. We talked about this before. The British had basically said after signing this area over in the Northwest uh, that, um, you know, in 1783, maybe we shouldn't have given this area over. Uh, they decided to maintain their forts in this region, and basically they said, we're not giving this back until you pay off your debts to British citizens, which by the early 1790s, the U.S. still hadn't done that. And so the British have these forts in this region, and a lot of people suspect that these British soldiers are supplying Indians with these weapons, and that's part of the reason they're becoming even more effective fighters in the early 1790s. So this is going to be uh, turn into to a big issue. Are you providing these Indians with weapons? Not only, we know you're seizing our ships. There's going to be a suspicion that you are that the British are supplying these Indians with weapons. There's actually going to be in 1794 a huge uh, kerfuffle. I don't know a better word, but you're going to have these whiskey farmers or whiskey distillers out here in western Pennsylvania. Tax are going to get so bad, and they're so upset from this whiskey tax. There's actually going to be a uh, whiskey tax rebellion as soldiers rebel for the fact that or I'm sorry these whiskey distillers rebel because they're paying this whiskey tax but the US army is failing to protect them against these northwest indians so ton of problems out in this western territory what the heck are we supposed to do about it and are the british supplying these weapons well 1792 the army starts rebuilding 1793 it's rebuilding a little bit more by 1794 the u.s army has come together uh and has uh, has increased up to 4,000. by the way this is something jefferson and the republicans don't like um because it's a big national army hamilton views this larger national army as a positive because he always wants the central government to have a larger national army and it's actually in part because of his reforms the additional taxes uh the slight increase in duties um the national bank that they're able to afford this large of an army but in uh 1794 this 4,000 man army will decide to attack this northwest territory it's actually interesting because the u.s is going to put down this whiskey rebellion and enter the Northwest Territory at the exact same time. The Army's uh, powerful enough to do both of those. Um, and what's going to happen in 1794 is the U.S. Army is going to go into this Northwest Territory and it's going to engage these Northwest Indians in a series of battle, battles. The biggest battle is going to be one uh, at this place called Fallen Timbers. So the Northwest Indians, the, the idea here is the Army will invade, take out the Northwest Indians, uh, and you know, destroy their army to prevent these raids on the frontier. Uh, well, they call this battle Fallen Timbers because the Northwest Indians, uh, they all joined together, joined their forces together, and they'd taken up a position behind the series of Fallen Timbers, which they're using as a fort. Well, this national army is uh, going to be so big uh, and so effective that it will defeat these uh, Northwest Indians in this battle on August 20th, 1794. And the Indians are going, the army's going to start running away. Well, the battle itself is not a big deal, but it's what happens after the Battle of Fallen Timbers is the Indian army is going to retreat to a British fort. There's a British fort nearby in American territory. Again, the British are still occupying these forts in this area. The Indians retreat there and basically they're going to start knocking on the door at the fort. Dude, let me in. Let me in. You know, uh... And it's going to be a clear indication to the Americans that are pursuing them that these Indians have been dealing with the British for a long time. Because why else would you treat, retreat to their fort and ask for them to protect you? Now, the British don't let the Indians in, but the American army that arrives at the British fort, again, this is on uh, Brit American territory, they basically see this as confirmation the British have been supplying the Northwest Indians. And they had been. This, But this is just the first time the Americans are going to learn definitively that they had. Uh, the Americans actually contemplate destroying the British fort, but they don't for international reasons. Well, right after this word uh, arrives of this, we have this congressional meeting, this meeting of Congress, um, and word comes back, we've just got proof that the British are supporting these Indians in the Northwest Territory. And the reason the British are doing this, by the way, is they want they think the united states might support the french in the french revolution and in their fight with britain and they're thinking 
Well, if that happens, we're just going to declare war on them, and we'll take the Northwest Territory very easily because the Indians have already pushed the Americans out of it. So it was like a preemptive measure. So now the British are not only seizing your ships, but we have confirmation that they are now arming these Indians that are attacking and killing American citizens. Well, as you can imagine, Congress is going to be livid. You're going to get Republicans immediately calling for declaring war on the British. Declare on the British, let's side with France, and let's join this international conflict. Uh, you're going to get you know, some Republicans, maybe not as angry, are, are going to say, all right, you know, Britain's pretty tough. Maybe we can't fight them right now. But what we should do is we should at least go to economic war with them. Cut the British off from trade, supply the French alone, and basically side with the French economically. So some people are going to be calling for direct fighting against the British. Others are going to be calling for uh uh, you know, economic war with the British. Even Federalists are going to be saying, we can't let this stand. The British are seizing our ships and maintaining these forts and supplying Northwest Indians. And so even a lot of Federalists are going to say, yeah, normally we favor the British, but this is a step over the line. So I want you to imagine that you're George Washington in this uh, situation. Let's go back to a picture of George Washington. Uh, and you know, what are you supposed to do about this? You're declaring neutrality. The British are violating your neutrality. Sure, the French are doing it a little bit, but the British are going overboard. Well, you know, uh, your Secretary of State, actually, it's kind of interesting. By this point, Jefferson resigned he, to focus on the Republican Party. But Washington's still going to have a lot of advisors who are going to say, dude, we've got to side against the British. They're not respecting our independence. We need to, uh, we need to fight them. This is too much. So you're going to have a lot of people advising either fighting the British or waging a war against the British economically and supporting the French. So I want you to think about Washington uh, getting this call for action against the British. You're also going to get Washington to get other opinions. And I want you to imagine Washington sitting in his room getting these advisors we need to take action against the British. They're shoving our head in the toilet. You know, um, they're, they're violating our neutral rights, not respecting our independence. And all these advisors leave, and then Washington's sitting there at this desk rubbing his temples like, what the heck am I supposed to do about this? Then out of nowhere, eyes pop open in the background, and it's Alexander Hamilton. He comes out of the darkness, starts massaging Washington's shoulders and saying, what do those people want? And Washington's saying, oh, Hamilton, I didn't know where you were at. And uh, Washington's like, oh, yeah, that feels good. And he uh, uh, tells Hamilton what everything that's happened and uh, uh, how everybody wants him to take action against the British, whether it be military action or whether it be economic action. Well, Hamilton is going to start massaging Washington. It didn't really happen that way, but close enough. But he's going to start saying, uh, well, what we should do is maybe side with the British. And Washington's going to be, what? Side with the British? Did you not listen? All, all the French did was this Genet thing. Um, the, the British have actually uh, uh, you know, killed Americans by arming these Indians. They've been stealing our stuff. Hamilton's going to say, trust me, side with the British. What we're going to see is Washington will end up sending this guy named John Jay to the British at the end of 1794 in British and the British and John Jay are going to reach an agreement known as Jay's Treaty. This is what we call Jay's Treaty. It's going to be signed by both parties end of 1794 but before it can be approved it's got to go to the Senate. So again the executive can send people to sign treaties but treaties aren't approved until the Senate uh, rules on them. So John Jay is going to head over make this agreement and he's going to bring back this Jay's Treaty. And what Jay's Treaty will say is that essentially the U.S. is siding with Britain over France. Jay's Treaty, the British will agree to, uh, the British are going to agree to leave this Northwest Territory, leave the forts in the Northwest Territory. That's the only thing that Britain's really given up here in this Jay's Treaty is we're going to leave these, tr these forts here. Um, they had promised to do that in 1783. They had not done that by 1794, but they say, we promise we're going to do this. So that's one thing that the British will agree to do. Uh, the only th the thing that America is going to agree to do 
is to grant Britain favored nation status. So a lot of people had been calling on the United States to uh, side with the French economically over the British. What this does is it basically sides with the British over the French. It says that the United States is going to uh, not trade directly between French ports any longer. So we've seen a lot of U.S. merchants going between France and the Sugar Islands of the French owns in the Caribbean. U.S. says we're not going to let that happen anymore. We're going to check our ship's logs, make sure that they, if they're trading with the French, they're doing it out of U.S. ports. So we don't want this direct back and forth that's been hurting British efforts uh, to, to sort of stranglehold the French Caribbean. You don't need to seize our ships anymore because they're not going to be trading directly between French ports. Other thing Jay's treaty will say is that uh, uh, the, we're granting Britain favored nation status and that we're going to lower goods between uh, coming uh, from Britain and going to Britain. So we're not going to um, uh, we're not going to uh, we're going to actually make it more profitable for American merchants to trade with the British than they would with other nations. So this basically means that. We're, United States will be collecting duties less on British goods to encourage Americans to trade with the British and, rather than the French. So basically, the uh, this is side going to discourage people trading with France. So I want you to think about this: the British are shoving the U.S.'s head into the toilet by arming Northwest Indians and uh, uh, by seizing American ships. U.S. get up out of the toilet and they basically say, "Want to be best buddies." That's what Jay's treaty is. Uh, that's what Jay's treaty is, and as we're going to see, a lot of people view it this way. And when it gets to the Senate, there's going to be a huge debate over whether or not to uh, accept this. Now, in order for a treaty to get approved, you need two-thirds majority in the Senate. By this point, the Republicans had started taking over the House, or were close to taking over the House, but they d had, didn't have control of the Senate. Senators last a lot longer, six years, um, and it's not something that's popularly elected. So Federalists make up about 20 out of 30 states. We just added Tennessee to the Union, so there's 15 states. So um, when it goes there, 20 Federalists are in the Senate, about 10 Republicans, and you're going to get exactly 20 Federalists siding with this Jay's Treaty, approving it. So it appro gets approved by just two-thirds majority. Barely, barely, barely passes, and we have uh, the United States now enter into this agreement that a lot of people say is the worst treaty in U.S. history. Now, before we get to that argument, there is some arguments to say that this is a positive treaty. By siding with the British economically, you are absolutely avoiding war with Britain. And this is going to be, a lot of people argue, very crucial. So in 1794-1795, the British have better navy than France, much better navy than France. Um, and if the U.S. went to war, so let's say the United States responded by siding with the French economically or directly declaring war on the British, immediately the British would uh, sh stop shipments out of all American ports. So the U.S. economy starting to get off of its feet would immediately shut down again. You're not going anywhere. Um, and basically, by the way, if you side with the French economically, the British might just go ahead and take that as war. So your economy is going to be shut down. And this new army you've been being created, part of part of the thing that's funding it is the duties on income and outgoing goods. Those are no longer going to come in because you're not getting shipments in and out. Not only that, but you can say goodbye to this Northwest Territory. So the British, the Northwest Indians had defeated the U.S. Army in battle. Imagine uh, what support they would have with the British Army actually along with them. They would easily kick any Americans, that uh, the handful of Americans that are in this Northwest Territory out by the end of 1795. Not only that, they might just take Kentucky. Uh, they might push over here to the Appalachian Mountains. It may even go down to Tennessee. This area is good probably gone if you go to war with the British. So some people credit Jay's Treaty with preventing war uh, with Britain and at a time when the U.S. could not afford to go to war with Britain. Instead, you now are going to have free trade. The French, their navy, as we'll talk about, can uh, seize the occasional American merchant, but they can't shut down American shipping like the British can. And the French are gone in North America. They don't have any uh, area to attack you from, so you're not losing any territory. So by siding with the British, it's kind of smart economically and a little bit smart uh, militarily. Uh, other people say that 
one of the positives or some of the positives that are going to come out of this treaty is that it's going to scare people. Particularly, it's going to scare the Indians of the Northwest Territory and it's going to scare the Spanish. So the Indians of this Northwest Territory, they'd been doing okay because they'd been uh, getting arms from these British soldiers. With them gone, with them pulling out of these forts, these Indians no longer have any assistance and they'd just been beaten by the American army in the Battle of Fallen Timbers. So what you're going to see in 1795, immediately after the British pull out their soldiers, is these Indians of the Northwest Territory are going to realize we've got to get pushed back a little bit here. We've got to surrender some of this land to the Americans. And so in 1795, there's going to be the signing of the Treaty of Greenville between the major Indian groups in what's essentially the area that's today Ohio and American officials. And this Treaty of Greenville will hand over all of this territory to the United States. So Indians will give up their claim to the land. Again, not good if you're an American Indian, but if you're in the United States at this time, this is going to remove this uh, immediate threat to these areas that the Indians aren't going to be raiding out of uh, this region any longer. So for the United States, that's going to be a positive. So Jay's Treaty, um, without the support of the British, is going to force Indians in this area to move west and sell this land to the United States. Jay's Treaty also scares, scares Spain. So Spain is, uh, as we had talked about, had shut down commerce through these rivers to prevent American expansion. Uh, and the Spanish are, again, nervous about American expansion. But now they're really scared because it looks like the British and the United States are on the same side and they could possibly push the Spanish territory. So the Spanish are nervous about this. So in 1795, only for a promise the U.S. will not invade Spanish territory. That's all they're going to ask. The Spanish will sign um, something called Pickney's Treaty in 1795 with the Spanish. And what this is going to do is Spain will agree to allow the Americans to use these rivers, specifically the Mississippi River, for commerce again. And it's going to give up its claims to this area down here. There have been a dispute over this area that's today Alabama and Mississippi. Um, there have been a dispute over Spain who owned it after the American Revolution. The Spanish will give up this, this territory. Now, it's going to take a while to get approved in the Spanish government. I think it's not until about 1800 or so that this land will eventually be approved. But um, Spanish will agree to give up uh, this territory and allow American merchants to use the ship simply because they're scared of this American-British alliance. So again, that's a victory uh, for Jay's Treaty. But the reason we call Jay's Treaty the worst uh, treaty in American history is the other things it's going to do. So imagine what you're going to think if you're a Republican seeing this treaty get passed, or if you're an American in general. This sounds like the United States is bending the knee to Britain. Britain's not respecting its neutrality, but we're siding with them over France, the people that helped us in the American Revolution. The American people are going to be upset, particularly Republicans. You're turning the back on the people that helped us, and you'll actually see you know, these riots over the signing of Jay's Treaty. As a matter of fact, Jay says after he arrived, you could walk from one end of the states to the other at night by the light of uh, himself burning an effigy because people are you know, burning these uh, you know dummies of, of uh, Jay uh, on on fires because they're so upset by it. Alexander Hamilton, you know, um, uh, because of his role in this and, and basically pushing to side with Britain, he's going to have stones thrown at him in New York. People are upset, particularly re Republicans are upset. Republicans are going to, again, accuse the uh, Federalists of bending the knee to Britain, uh, you know, turning their back on their revolutionary ally uh, in favor of uh, the British. The French, you can imagine how they're going to react. The French hear about Jay's Treaty. What the? They're the ones violating your neutral rights. We're your friends, and this is what you do to us. So the French are going to be incredibly upset by this. Uh, they're actually going to withdraw their diplomats from the United States, and they're going to be threatening war with the U.S. by the end of 1795. So going into 1796, you have Republicans are going to be so angry. This is when you're going to start seeing accusations uh, made. This is when you're going to start saying maybe we should use this information we have about Alexander Hamilton. This is going to be when you're going to start seeing people fighting one another. Madison and Jefferson are going to be talking smack about Washington for um, approving this treaty and listening to Hamilton so much. People are so angry, and it looks like the U.S. might be either going to war with France or they might be going to war with each other. We may have a civil war here. 
But thankfully in 1796, you've got George Washington as president. He served two terms. And everybody assumes he's going to run a third term because America needs him right now. There's no limit on how many terms a president can serve. And so people are going to say, in these trying times, at least George Washington has our, our back and he's going to keep us together. Unfortunately, in 1796, Washington says, I'm done with this crap. I'm not going to run a third term. Somebody else can deal with these political parties. Somebody else can deal with France. I'm sick of it. I'm going to GTFO. I'm going back to my uh, farm in Virginia. Somebody else can deal with this nonsense. 1796, Washington says, if you guys, your electors, choose me as president, I'm not going to accept it. Somebody else has to do it. So what are we going to do now? The United States is political fighting. You've got uh, a war threatening with France. We need somebody strong, and George Washington is not there. Who are we going to get? Are we going to get Lincoln? You know, he badass. You know, a, a guy that can you know serve the United States during a civil war. Kick ass here, riding a bear. Uh, what? Well, no, he's not even born yet. Well, what about uh, Teddy Roosevelt? This guy, black belt in jujitsu, a uh, guy that's uh, you know uh, just a badass war hero. We could use him. Is he going to step up and save the United States? No, he's not going to be born for another 50 years. What we're going to get uh, as a replacement for George Washington is this guy, John Adams, and we'll talk about how he solves this problem next time.